Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. I'm sorry that I haven't really been uploading consistently the last couple of days, but that's because I'm doing a lot of work on uh, homework and that kind of thing. And I have a big, um, what do you call it, a project going in school at the moment, so I don't really have time to upload that much, but we're gonna do it today. Um, today we're gonna be watching the fifth part of the Great Northern War series by Kings and Generals. The Battle of Gardabush. Um So yeah, if you like the video, uh, like, like and subscribe, and um, yeah, remember to go and check the original video by Kings and Generals. But anyway, let's watch it. The Battle of Poltava marks the turning point in the Great Northern War. The Swedes. Sorry, but subtitles on. I'm uh, uh, just gonna turn it off who were on the offensive for the majority of the last decade, were left with the difficult task of defending their empire without their elite army. The Russians, finally out from the shadow of their earlier defeats, were at liberty to attack in all directions without the worry of a powerful opposing army. The rest of Sweden's enemies would not sit idle at this opportunity either. The conflict was far from over, and although Sweden's military might was crippled, they would not go down. Peter left Poltava for Kiev shortly after the surrender of the Swedish army at Perivolochna. Once there, he sent letters throughout the continent, describing the details of the battle and his complete victory. Europe was left in complete shock. Until that moment, they had only received news of continuous Swedish victories. The Duke of Marlborough... So, so in the aftermath of the Poltava, uh, just, just to be clear, um, Charles XII goes to Bender uh, in the Ottoman Empire where he's stuck, which is a huge problem for Sweden because remember that is an ab Sweden is an absolute monarchy. So while there is there is a government that is in charge, but it but in every major decision they always need approval from the king, and you can imagine the communication problems that arise because arose because of that. Um, yeah, um, the Swedish army have surrendered. There's kind of some similarities with Napoleon here in the sense that. Many of the veterans of the Swedish of the Swedish army, not all of them, but many of them died during the or got captured or something like that, and um, exiled to Siberia. And um, yeah, that's a very that's a huge disaster for everyone uh, for the Swedish army because suddenly there isn't enough, um, so they we don't have enough soldiers to defend the empire, and the king is stuck in the Ottoman Empire. So yeah, it's just. A giant disaster for them. Ra famously wrote, We have no confirmation as yet of the battle between the Swedes and the Muscovites, but should it be true of the first being so entirely beaten as is reported, what a melancholy reflection it is that after constant success for ten years, Charles XII should in two hours mismanagement and ill success ruin himself and his country. The rest of Europe... And... Marlborough had met with um, with Charles XII, and I I'm pretty sure that he kind of warned him not to go too far. So um, he had met with him in Saxony, in Leipzig. So Absolute had a similar disposition towards the Russian victory. However, some welcomed Russia onto the European stage. The famous polymath and philosopher Leibniz remarked that Peter would now be the Turk of the North. Charles himself only avoided capture by sacrificing the majority of his elite army and his most trusted commanders. Though Russian forces pursued the Swedish king, they could not catch him before he crossed the Bug and entered Ottoman territory. Sultan Ahmed III prepared a camp for Charles and his followers at Bender, and they would settle there for the time being. Peter was a It became like this isolated colony. A Swedish colony in the middle of nowhere, and um, yeah, and again, and you can see again the problems. Like the king is here, and Sweden is being attacked. Every major decision needs his approval in some way. So um, yeah, and he will try everything to make the Ottoman Ottoman Empire go to war with Russia. And um, yeah, elated because of his grand victory. Yet he was also equally disappointed due to Charles and Mazeppa's escape into Ottoman lands. Wasting no time, 
The Tsar entered diplomatic talks with Augustus of Saxony, Frederick of Denmark, Frederick William of Prussia, and George I of Hanover. The victorious Russian army was subsequently split in two. Sheremetev would move north towards the Baltic, while Menshikov would advance west into Poland. Stanisław, whose position in Poland was already negligible, saw his royal authority erode completely after the defeat of the Karolian army. Augustus repudiated the Treaty of Altrinstadt and advanced into Poland with an army. The magnates of the Commonwealth, either out of dislike towards Stanisław or fear of Russian aggression, began endearing themselves to their former monarch and offered him the crown once again. Left without any alternative, Stanisław joined the Swedish forces in their retreat to Pomerania and then abdicated. To compensate him for the loss, he would actually be, funnily enough, um, Augustus. He would, act, when he died, they would actually re-elect Stanislav. I only think he was a monarch of Poland for one year extra, but still, um, in 1933, ni sorry, not 1933. I mean, 1733. Um, I think that was when he came to the throne. I'm gonna look that up. I don't want to say any lies. Okay, um, it was 1733, but um. He did so. He did reign until seven, 1736 when he lost the throne again. So for three years. Crown, Charles granted him the Principality of Zweibrücken and named him Count Palatine. King once again, Augustus met Peter on the 9th of October at Turin. He feared Peter's reaction to having been abandoned in 1706. However, the Tsar did not hold a grudge. Nevertheless, at dinner. Peter could not resist an ironic thrust at Augustus's faithlessness. I always wear the cutlass you gave me, Peter said, but it seems you do not care for the sword I gave you, as I see you are not wearing it. Augustus replied that he prized Peter's gift, but that somehow in the haste of his departure from Dresden, he had left it behind. Ah, said Peter, then let me give you another. He gave Augustus the same sword he had given him before which had been discovered in Charles's baggage at Poltava. The monarchs signed a new treaty that effectively made the Commonwealth a Russian dependency in all but name. The Russian And it's here, around this time when Sweden is about to lose, that suddenly all the allies begin to split among themselves. And yeah, I'm sure it's gonna go more into this as we go along, so yeah, but a lot of that division that arises in the in the coalition against Sweden is because of Russia and its growing influence. ...were allowed to station their troops in the Commonwealth. Peter would become the guarantor of the rights of the Polish nobility, while Augustus would join all of Peter's wars. One secret clause of the treaty was that Augustus would be allowed to claim Livonia. In the following days, Peter also established alliances with the Danes and the Prussians, who would enter the war again by the end of 1709. A large Danish army landed in Scania at the beginning. So Denmark, around this time, Denmark had sent many of its troops to help in the Spanish War of Succession. We had served in Blenheim, in Marlborough's army. I think specifically we served, we also served with the Austrians in many of their war, in some of their wars, mostly in the Spanish War of Succession. However, also a few internal rebellions, I think. Um, yeah. And, we, the help troops we sent uh, basically meant we had m many, um, what do you call it, um, we, uh, the soldiers were more experienced because of that. Um, it did pro annoy France because we, because we have made a, we have made the uh, agreements with France before the war. And so the fact we sent help tr troops to help the other side against them kind of annoyed them, but still, um, yeah, but we sent an army. On a year on the Ramesau is his name. We also prepared an army up here. I think it was Jarlsberg who was in charge of that. But um, in in Norway, but that never came to anything. Beginning of 1710, alarmed at the prospect of an attack on mainland Sweden, a 15,000 strong army was raised by Magnus Stienbock. At the Battle of Helsingbury in March, the Swedish army decisively defeated their Danish counterpart. There was a, a, they advanced all the way to Christianstad. There's, their, the goal was actually, uh, Karlskrona. That was the goal, but we were unable to attack it. We won, 
Christianstad, just few skirmishes there, but we had, didn't have enough men to attack Karlskrona. So we were forced to retreat uh, to Helsingborg, where um, yeah, we got decisively defeated. Rattensau was able, to, he was a very good cavalry commander. It was said that he was able to, um, he was um, able to do, do very well with the cavalry, but everywhere else we were broken. Um, not only that, but he was not the original commander. The original com- commander was Ravenlev. I think it was, I think that's how you say his name, um, Ravenlev. But um, he, um, uh, he was forced to go home because of sickness, I think. This effectively marks the last time that the Danish tried to reclaim Scania. Yes, that's true. That is, um, in fact, when every town we advanced through, every major town at the very least, we forced uh, every the citizens and the mayors and stuff like that. We forced them to um, to swear oath of loyalty to the Danish king. Um, most of which were broken immediately. I think only like. I think Ball really kind of actually wanted to voluntarily, I think. As Augustus was consolidating his power in the Commonwealth for most of 1710, and the Danish were rebuilding their armies at the same time, the western front of the war went through a lull for most of the year. The same cannot be said for the eastern Baltic, though. Sweden's Baltic ports remained relatively undefended now that the Karolian army had capitulated. In July, Riga, Sweden's richest and most populous city, surrendered to the Russians after negotiating the restorations of old privileges for the Livonian nobility. According to the Treaty of Torin, Riga was supposed to be handed over to Augustus, however the topic seemingly never resurfaced again. Dunamunda and Pernau fell in August, while Arensberg and Revel capitulated in September. Revel was a very, very important city for the Swedish, for the Swedish, very strategic location. And yeah, they have just lost the entire Livonian and Estonian region of the empire, the Swedish. So, a major disaster there. In March of the same year, Viborg had been besieged too. Suffering from a lack of supplies and artillery, the Russian army was unable to assault the well-defended fortress. Finally, after several months, Peter arrived with his new fleet, bringing his army much-needed food and weapons. The massive Russian artillery barrages breached the walls within a few days, and the Swedish garrison quickly surrendered. With this, Peter had finally achieved one of his main personal goals, to form a powerful defensive corridor around his capital, St. Petersburg. The Russians led several offensives into Finland during the next two years. However, due to logistical issues, they were unsuccessful. No sooner had Charles taken refuge in the Ottoman Empire, Peter had begun sending letters to the Sultan, requesting the Swedish king's extradition. These letters became increasingly threatening as the months passed, much to the annoyance of Ahmed. Taking the last of Peter's letters as a personal insult, the Sultan declared war on Russia in October of 1710. The Tsar was still under the impression of his victory at Poltava, and this prompted him to enter the war with a much smaller army than the Ottoman one, relying only on the support of Moldavia and Wallachia. This war, known as the Pruth Campaign, ended in a swift defeat for the Russians, with Peter himself only avoiding being captured due to the incompetence of the Ottoman Grand Vizier. The subsequent... Yeah, he was also a very good negotiator. He was able to get out of the war despite major major defeat by only... Um, only, yeah. Uh, ...treaty stipulated, among other things, that Peter... Yes, only a couple of things, right? Seats, us off. That's it. And a couple of smaller things like that. But, um, yeah, it was, it was, he's a very, Peter the Great may not be a very good tactician on the battlefield. He's not really in many battles, but he, but he is certainly a very good negotiator. He was able to get out of a crushing defeat just with a couple of concessions here and there. However, he did lose the only part he had on the Azov, the Sea of Azov. So, um, yeah, that was perhaps a bit of a problem, but. He is getting so much up in the north, so it didn't really matter, I think. Peter would allow Charles free passage to Sweden. Charles would not use that right, however. 
instead choosing to remain in the Ottoman Empire to try and persuade the Sultan to attack Russia again. This is gonna become increasingly more and more annoying. In 1711, the Allied forces began a massive offensive into Swedish Pomerania, besieging the fortresses of Stralsund, Stettin and Wismar. But since the armies were more interested in raiding the countryside, the sieges were not effective. Additionally, disagreements between the commanders and a lack of siege artillery ensured that nothing of note would be achieved. In September, Stienbock landed on the island of Rügen with a large army. Alarmed at the prospect of facing a strong Swedish... That was... Uh, we were actually meant to stop that. We actually had a... The Danish fleet had a... We had a fleet in the sea. I think it was Gudenlöwe. Gudenlöwe. That was in charge of that, but... Um, but yeah, he... Uh, was, but despite constantly patrolling the area right here with, with ships, he was unable to actually... Um, uh, stop the Swedish from crossing, crossing the, the Baltic. But, um, yeah, Mauro Stenbock is a very effective administrator, I think. He was able to organize an arm, army very quickly and still keep the offensive going for a long period of time. But, yeah, now he's gonna cross into Germany. So, and, yeah. The army, the Allied forces retreated from Stralsund and Stettin. As the Allies were insufficiently strong to take such well-garrisoned cities, they remained content with sporadic raids on smaller settlements. In the spring of 1712, another strong Swedish army arrived in Stralsund. Consequently, the Danish navy began tightening its grip over the Baltic Sea, which worsened the situation for the defenders of the Swedish forts. Stienbock knew that Stralsund would not survive a combined land and sea-based blockade. However, Facing the combined Danish-Saxon-Russian army was not a feasible option either. In autumn, the Allied forces split up into two, so that one part could raid Mecklenburg. Stienbock's options were now to face a large Russian-Saxon army south of Stralsund, or to head west into Mecklenburg and fight the Danish. In the end, he decided on the latter option. Peter was in Dresden at the time, recovering from an illness. He was already furious because of the lack of coordination between the Allied commanders, and after hearing of Stienbock advancing towards Mecklenburg, he ordered his forces to engage in a pursuit without him. Stienbock advanced quickly, much faster than the Russian Saxon armies did. On the 3rd of December, the Danish army encamped for winter quarters southwest of Wismar, near the town of Gadebusch. The Swedish army arrived at Vernau on the 14th, and by the 18th, they were already at Brusewitz, merely 10 kilometers away from the Danish army. At that point, the Russian army was south of Lake Schwerin and could not provide any assistance. Only a small Saxon cavalry detachment arrived to aid the Danish by the eve of the battle. Stienbock knew that... Actually, it is correct that Frederick IV was with the army, but I'm pretty sure that he was not in command. I think it was... Von Stolten, that actually was that in command. Any delay would be detrimental to his cause. So he marched his army through a snowstorm, arriving on the other side of the river on the morning of the 20th. Jobs von Stoltens, the leader of the Danish army, placed, yes, von Stolten, uh, yeah. placed his forces behind a river and dense marshland near the village of Wackenstedt. The strong Danish defensive position made their leaders believe that the Swedes would turn south and try to cross the river at a safer point before attacking. After reconnaissance, however, Stienbock concluded that their only chance of victory would be through a f The Allied army was around 17,000 strong, with 8,000 Danish infantrymen, 5,000 cavalry, along with another 4,000 Saxon horsemen. The Swedish army had about 12,500 men, with 6,500 footmen and 6,000 cavalry. Both sides placed their, it's really said more artillery, though. their infantry in the center and their cavalry on the flanks. The Swedes had 30 cannons, while the Danish had 14. Jobs von Schulten led the Danish army, Jakob von Fleming led the cavalry on the left flank, Stienbock led the Swedish army. At 1 p.m., the Swedish artillery opened fire. On the day, on the day that the battle began, I actually think there was a regrouping um, with the Danish army where Fleming wanted 
his um, cavalry to be more efficiently placed. So um, he decided to place them. We decided to regroup and place them on the flanks, flanks that we see them here. And um, yeah, so there was a bit of confusion on the day that it happened. Fire, and the rest of their troops advanced. The Swedes were using a new type of cannon, which was more mobile and precise than the Danish artillery. Their artillery barrage not only managed to cover the advance of their troops, but also dealt heavy casualties to the Danish forces. The Swedish infantry advanced towards the Danish position through a narrow clearing. Adhering to the Karolian tactics, they advanced until they could discern their enemy's facial features and fired several devastating volleys. The Danish infantry returned fire, however it was not precise. Skoltens attempted to break the Swedish center with a cavalry attack from the right. This attack failed due to precise Swedish volleys, as well as artillery barrages, and the cavalry retreated after suffering significant casualties. Afterwards, the Swedish left attacked the winded Danish right. This forced Skulten to wheel his entire army to the left to avoid being outflanked. Simultaneously, the Swedish cavalry on the right managed to find a small path through the marsh and attacked. The Danish left was caught completely by surprise and began retreating because of the relentless Swedish assault. The Allied army, though in a strong defensive position, was suffering from disorganization. Fleming, the leader of the Danish forces on the left, requested that the cavalry which was kept behind Wackenstedt be brought to the front on the morning of the battle. Skolten acquiesced, however his order came in late and those cavalry regiments were caught behind the Danish left during the retreat. That was, that's what I talked about, the regrouping part, yeah, which was not really carried out all at well. As they were unprepared for battle and caught in a position where maneuvering was difficult, disorder broke loose within their ranks. They were pushed back to Wackenstedt, where brutal fighting ensued. The quick and precise Swedish assault along the entire front pushed the Danish army back and some units began routing. Unable to save their left flank, Fleming and Skultens retreated behind Wackenstedt and formed a new defensive line there. The Swedish left once again assaulted the Danish right. However, they were fired upon by the Danish Royal Guard and lost some of their momentum. Nevertheless, the Danish right almost broke and Fleming had to reinforce it with his Saxon cavalry. The Saxons managed to- It's just disaster, there's no- We had a good defensive position, but because of poor organization regrouping that when that was carried out poorly and just really good Swedish tactics. It kind of reminds me a bit of Napoleon in a way, you know, concentrate your artillery, concentrate your infantry in one position and and break through them. Of course, that is not Napoleon in the same way, but still, it's kind of that. It's in, in a way that's kind of it. But um, yeah, it's just going so poorly. Like <laughs> we Danish are really not all that good for when it comes to warfare. Stabilize the line. However, their attempts to push the Swedes back were unsuccessful. The Royal Guard still continued firing at the Swedish cavalry, causing many casualties. This forced Stenbock to send his elite infantry regiments to fight them, and the two sides engaged in a brutal melee. This engagement was eventually won by the Swedes, and the Danish centre began to retreat. The Saxons, though unable to defeat the Swedish left, fought fiercely and ensured that their enemies could not pursue the retreating forces. Most of the troops on the Danish left were either killed or captured, and only a few soldiers managed to retreat with the rest of the army. In the end, the Danish army lost all of their artillery and about 6,500 men, most of whom were captured, while the Swedes lost 1,500. Although this battle was a tactical success for Stienbock's army, it proved to be strategically insignificant. The Danish army was not completely broken, and the Russians and Saxons still had overwhelming numerical superiority. Furthermore, and it's, it is it didn't really matter at the end of the day because we would still be able to conquer um, Wismar and Stralsund and, Bre and Bremen and those areas. Bremen, no, nope, not Bremen, but uh, Stralsund and Wismar at the least, and they are able to conquer Gotrop. In those areas at the end of the day so this battle didn't really matter that much 
in the grand scheme of things. But it, it does show it is the last major victory on the field by the Swedish army during the empire years of the, Swe the Swedish empire. So, um, yeah. The Swedish army was no longer within the safety of Stralsund's walls, and marching back would be a risky move. A lack of supplies also began to take its toll on them, and to make matters worse, the Baltic Sea was still frozen, so resupplying by ship was not an option. Stienbock subsequently moved west with his army, trying to extort funds and supplies out of the Danish-controlled city of Altona. Yes, he tried, he, he tried to um, get so much money out of it that it was impossible for him to pay in Altona. And he, yes, he burned it down. When the citizens failed to meet the overwhelming demands, the Swedish army burned the city to the ground. The you can see that he's desperate. Like, he goes into a, a, a relatively small time, town and says, and say, you need to pay a huge sum of money. They can't, and he burns it. Like, he's beginning to get desperate. The army headed east afterwards. However, it was surrounded by a large Russian-Saxon force nearby turning. Breaking his neutrality, Charles Frederick of holstein gottorp provided refuge to the Swedish army inside his fort, as with the Spanish War of Succession nearly over. Which would spell the doom of Gottorp. Gottorp was still semi-independent by this point, but because of this, Denmark would be able to completely, in a way, subjugate them and incorporate them into the king kingdom. The Duke expected aid from Great Britain and the United Provinces, just like in 1700. Their ships never arrived, and with hunger and disease running rampant throughout his army, Stienbock surrendered on the 13th of May. Having lost another army, Charles seems to be in dire straits, with defeat being an increasingly realistic option. The Allied powers were more than willing to make peace with Sweden. Charles, adamant that he would not relinquish even an inch of land, refused even the most lenient offers. With the king so headstrong and averse to defeat, it became evident that war-weary Sweden would not sue for peace, at least not while Charles XII was still breathing. Our next episode will see the conclusion of the Great Northern War, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patron supporters and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the- Anyway, that was a very good video, really good, very interesting time I think. But anyway, uh, like and subscribe the video, remember to go and check the original video and sorry for not really uploading all that consistently, but um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, tell me what you think I thought of it in the comments below and if you have any suggestions, this series is beginning to run out, like there's only one episode left. If you have any idea of what to do next or what I should react to next, please tell me in the comments below. But anyway, I see you guys later.